going round, uh, return our CTF petition for people to sign. Can I just hand it down and then you can just take it through the crowd and uh, get it signed. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Mostly it's great because this is going to terrify the BAP wherever they are today. I want to welcome all of you. I also want to welcome the ISD officers in the crowd. Yeah. So it's a concern for all of us Singaporeans. The CPF has come to symbolize the government's relationship to us. Um, and it is not a healthy relationship. It was a relationship formed in fear and it thrives in silence. Now, there's a famous story about Mao Zedong, I don't know if you've heard it. He once went to a factory. And uh, Mao was a great fan of Hunan mangoes. He was from Hunan. And a little child gave him a basket of Hunan mangoes. So he took one little mango and gave it to the child. And the manager of the factory put it in resin and put it on a shelf. And every day, all the workers had to bow to this Mao mango. True story. After that, what happened to the mango? It starts to rot, right? So they took it down, the managers. They boiled it in water. And all the workers had to drink a little of this holy rotten mango water. Now anyone could have known that this is going to make people sick, but nobody told the manager. So they lost hundreds and hundreds of person hours there. Now our um, public finances are like the Hunan mango. They have poisoned the public debate. The public debate cannot continue precisely because of this poisonous silence at the heart of it. The people who then speak on this, they become a threat, not to the policy, but to the status quo. And those who depend on the status quo will then fight tooth and nail, as we are seeing, to preserve it. Now, over these 55 years of PAP governance from 1959, the state has brought all public institutions under their supervision by one method or another by the promise of promotions or bonuses the availability of citizens resources the registration of societies from detention to torture they have ensured that your citizenship depends on your agreement even if it's only silent with the government's worldview. Now, against those who have not been silent, let me put this down. Let me just tell you that these are donations that people have been giving to me. I'll speak about this in a minute. There's a small admin charge when I collect donations. <laughs> those who have not uh, been silent, Mr. Jayaratnam's father being one of them 20 years ago, the government has used every means to destroy these people. Recall JBJ. Recall Mr. Tang Liang Hong. Recall the Operation Spectrum detainees, some of whom are here today. Ask the surviving detainees from Operation Pacha and Operation Cold Store, those who were detained during the so-called Euro-Communism uh, affair in 1976. These were all lies as we know them today to be. Ask Tan Wa Piao, who had to leave Singapore and now lives in England. Ask Dr. Chi and the leadership of the PAP. Ask Leslie Chu, Lin Li, Han Hui Hui, Alex Ao. You can ask me as well. I also had a few love letters from Tan Chuan Jin. <laughs> but 
His love is quite cheap, 5,000 a minute. Now, we are met today not on the grounds of the CPF. We are met to undermine the idea that for good governance, for stability, we need to have a bullying government. A government that will sue and imprison and torture. This event is about our right to good governance and the information upon which it must rest. Or else there is no good governance. You may disagree with Roy's findings. You may disagree with the way in which he puts his information out. But there is no one on the island today who can claim not to be at least a little bit unsettled by the way in which our public finances are managed. And the government is also unsettled. It is unsettled because the CPF is at the heart of its entire policy framework. The government's assertion that the CPF is our money, we heard it from Tan Chuan Jin a few days ago, and that it is the best policy option for public welfare is untrue. And ministers know this to be the case. In these 55 years of uninterrupted government, uninterrupted one-party government, if you have all people who should be living off their CPF, having to sell tissue paper and collect cardboard to survive, if you have people who have to clean toilets into their old age because they have no money, if you have people who are committing suicide because they cannot afford health care, and if you have to have a Maintenance of Parents Act so that parents can sue their children to look after them, then we do not have a good system. And try, try as they might, try as they might, the government cannot run away from this idea. And they can defend themselves only if they reveal the intricacies of our public policy, which we know they refuse to do. Now, at its origin 60 years ago, 60 years next year, the CPF was a simple uh, pension scheme. 5% from the employee, 5% from the employer, 55 you get the lump sum, you can go to Batam for all the government care. <laughs> but, slowly, when the PAP began to dominate parliament, you remember the Barisan walked out in 67, in 68 they captured all the seats because all their uh, uh, adversaries were in jail. They began to use the CPF not as a pension scheme but as an operative scheme, an operative policy, meaning a policy to mop up problems in other policy areas. Like what? Healthcare. Oh, sorry, housing. People didn't want to buy HDB flats. They didn't know whether it was going to be a good investment. So in 68, they released CPF funds for HDB. Then they were released for education, higher education, to placate parents whose children suffered from the restrictive university admission policy. Then came MediSafe, which allowed the government to cut down on its public spending of uh, health care. Then privatized share purchases when they wanted to sell off our public assets. And in a roundabout way, when they decided that ministers needed hundreds of thousands of dollars, the CPF uh, 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 and its relationship to GDP was used to ensure their exorbitant uh, GDP-linked bonuses. And finally, we are all locked into a wage system. Why? Because there is no public welfare outside of the government-controlled network. The, the manipulation of the CPF has fixed the PAP in power and it has entrenched our position as economic digits. It has enabled the PAP to safeguard its longevity and keep us, the voters, in a state of constant subjection. This is the reason for Mr. Li Xianlong's sensitivity to criticism. Because the minute you turn even a cursory glance at the framework, you realize that the PAP has benefited from the CPF far more than we, the members of it. When, the, when ministers come out to defend the CPF, they are defending themselves, not us. 
Unfortunately, my friends, the CPF has come to denote the relationship of the government to Singapore. I don't mean the people of Singapore. I mean Singapore Incorporated, this huge money-making machine that we service, we the workers, at the expense of our elderly, at the expense of our children, at the expense of our poor families, at the expense of our disabled people. We service it. And we give up our dignity for it. But the promise of an old age spent in comfort that has never arrived. Except for Lee Kuan Yew. My friends, ultimately, Roy Nung isn't the slanderer of his neighbor's injured reputation. This is a man who has been in parliament for 30 years, a minister for 27, PM for 10, in a party that has governed this nation for 55 uninterrupted years. And if he claims that he is injured by one blog post out of the plethora of blog posts that we have, it says more about the policy than about the man trying to defend it or Roy Ernie, who has tried to undermine it. Roy Ernie is a casualty. He is a casualty of a regime that depends for its endurance on silence. He asks questions that if they are answered, would unravel the lie that is at the heart of the claim that the PAP cares for the citizens. The claim that they are the best government we could ever have. Because leaders, good leaders, stand on their policy outcomes. They don't stand in the libel courts. Roy Ong has told the emperor that he has no clothes. And the emperor, well, in Singapore's case, not the emperor, but the crown prince, because the emperor is retired now. <laughs> the, the crown prince has begun to panic. These last true three weeks, what we have seen is a government in overdrive, because they panic. Yeah! Yeah! Now cry if you must that Roy's data wasn't complete, or that his words were intemperate. But we citizens, if we are to be citizens at all, must not any longer pretend that the emperor is wearing any clothes. Yeah. That, Roy, that Roy has gathered so much support. All of you here, I'm told, in the region of 3,000 people. More. More. 90 more, approaching $100,000. I think I'm right in saying that must be one of the largest amounts ever given to an opponent of the PAP to defend the defamation action. Yeah. This is not an indication of his popularity or the quality of his data. Although to me his data is perfectly sound given the data limitations we face, and in terms of popularity, you can see him wherever he is now, always surrounded by a bunch of people. So that's not in question. This today is an indication that we are tired of being bullied. Yeah. We are the people beginning to see, we are the people fundamentally acknowledging the mirage that is the PAP's claim to good governance. And as with all mirages, the closer you get to that oasis, the, the clearer you realize it is an illusion. Now, let us not allow this moment <coughs> to dissipate. Let us not allow this to become a footnote in the legal textbooks. Let us not allow the PM to silence those who will speak for us, ordinary citizens. These causes, these causes, empowering Singaporeans, all the various blocks, TOC, the various political parties, their research papers, their walkabouts, these causes make the PM and his friends very nervous. Yes! 
but we need them. And they need the resources to continue their valuable work. We don't need them. The police have told Roy that he cannot put out uh, boxes to collect funds. But as I understand it, a uh, private appeal for donations doesn't come under these laws. And since they have allowed us to make donation appeals from your personal friends, and since all of you are my friends, yeah, yeah. I am making a personal appeal. Yeah. But because I have so many friends, <laughs> give to these causes. They need your money, they need your time, and they need your commitment. But most of all, most of all, they need your citizenship. The nation needs your citizenship. Do not, do not any longer allow the state to define our citizenship for us. We will do it ourselves. Thank you.